German tiger quickly earned a reputation for being almost invincible. But it was severely compromised as a fighting machine. Its armour is thicker than virtually any tank before it, over 100 millimetres at the front. It weighs something in the region of 56 tonnes. As a consequence, it comes with all manner of limitations. To give an example, in order to bear this great weight, extra wide tracks are needed and loads of wheels to press on the track. It is so heavy that it is endlessly stressing the engine and gearbox. You get this thing into really difficult country, you stand a pretty fair chance of having it completely disabled itself. It was totally on the limit in terms of weight and power for anything that had been seen in action before. Tank designers needed to come up with lighter armour without losing any protection. One solution came from the Russian T-34, with an innovation that others were to copy, sloping armour. This piece of armour is 100 millimetres thick when positioned vertical. Angled at 30 degrees, the armour becomes twice as thick at 200 millimetres. To keep the armour at 100 millimetres thick only requires half as much steel, making the tank significantly lighter. The sloping armour of the T-34 had a downside. There was much less room in the front of the tank for the driver and the gunner. The solution? Smaller constructs. On the plus side, some conventional shells simply bounced off. Sloping armour forced weapons designers to think again. They were looking for something to penetrate this new generation of protection. The struggle between ammunition and armour entered a new phase. In their quest to come up with more deadly weapons, designers looked back into history and surprisingly found the answer in a principle discovered in the 17th century. In the days of the big sieges, gunners observed they were losing power from their cannons. A cannonball had to be loose enough not to jam in the barrel. This allowed a lot of the force of the gunpowder to escape through the gap around the sides. Gunners devised an ingenious way to plug this gap, a tightly fitting wooden bung called a sabre, or wooden shoe. Well, I'm just fixing the sabre here, onto the base of the ram shot, or cannonball, if you like. 400 years on, we've asked artillery expert Colin Herriot to demonstrate what a sabre round does. Just a piece of wood like that. When the cannon falls, if you've just got a cannonball in there, you lose a lot of power. With this lump of flat wood, the blast will hit it. And before this blows apart and disintegrates, in that millisecond, that will give the initial impetus and will throw the cannonball further and faster. That was the theory. Colin has two attempts to prove it. He'll fire his cannon at this makeshift target. The first round will be a plain shot without the sabo, and the second will have his homemade sabo attached. Right up. For both shots, the distance to the target is the same. The amount of powder and charge and the size and weight of cannonball identical. It's a test to see which round has more power. The plan is to shoot a nice and full. Full got in. She's pouring. And she's ready to go. Ready then? The first round hits the target, but it's very low down. There's the ball. She's come through there. Hit there, and bounced off. Will the shot with the saddle attached do any better? Well, 
look at that. Smack dead centre. Ball's gone through a good four inches of very strong Douglas fur. Not only does the Sabo give it more power, but it you give it more accuracy. Played right through and have a look around the back end see what it's done there. The simple addition of a small disc of wood has effectively increased the punching power of Collins' cannon by a third. Come through pretty fast. We then have the second target over here. It's hit it so fast, almost as if the wood doesn't even know it's been hit. Right through. Late in the Second World War in 1943, a Belgian scientist working for the British took the Sabo principle one step further. Ladislaus Permutter calculated that a smaller projectile would fly through the air much faster than a big shell. And if this projectile were made from a dense heavy material like tungsten carbide, it could penetrate even the thickest armour. But how to fire a small projectile from a big gun? Herr Mutter's solution, a sabot that encased the projectile, increasing its girth, making it fit snugly into the barrel. No power was lost when the gun was fired. Armour expert, Dr. Paul Hazel. This is a relatively modern version of what Mutter invented in 1943, and what we have here is the penetrator, which is enclosed by this boot, or this sabot, which that carries the uh, this penetrator up the gun barrel, and when the whole assembly leaves the gun barrel, the sabo becomes separated by the air resistance that is offered to the sabo. And it's essentially like a very fast moving crossbow bolt. As it sits in the breech, the sabo holds the projectile firmly in place. When the gun is fired, the assembly moves rapidly up the barrel. Almost immediately, the sabo peels away and falls to the ground. On impact, there's no explosion. The speed and density of the penetrator cuts through armour, causing complete devastation. This is an example of a target that's been struck by a 120mm Sabo round. And here we have the type of projectile that was used. And as you can see around the outside of the target, you can see quite a significant amount of plastic deformation. In other words, the material has moved apart and has been permanently deformed uh, as the, the projectile penetrates. These super-penetrating weapons inspired new concepts in armour. They experimented with special composites, using layers of ceramic and glass fibre sandwiched between steel. Some layers reduce the transmission of shock from squash-head rounds. Others provide resistance to new penetrating projectiles. Mm. 